Hello and welcome to Jam Hammer. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to play the amazing and hilarious game of fantasy football set within an alternative version of the Warhammer Old World, Blood Bowl. This game features two opponents, or coaches, who select teams of miniatures, called players here, to take part in the fast-paced and often violent sport Blood Bowl. It's mostly a parody of American football, but incorporates some elements of rugby and, well, actual football, you know, with the ball being controlled with the feet. Soccer, if you will. The first edition of Blood Bowl was released way back in 1986, and came complete with cardboard players prior to Citadel releasing a range of metal miniatures. Several subsequent editions were released up until the fourth and final release in 2002 that was kept alive with a living rulebook. That is, until 2015 when Games Workshop announced the return of Specialist Games with a new edition of the game being released in 2016, and then updated again with the current version that we will be learning today. Blood Bowl second season, released in 2020. To mark the release of this contemporary rule set, Games Workshop produced this fantastic box complete with hardback rulebook, two-sided playing board, dugouts, dice, templates and two teams, the Thunder Valley Greenskins and the Bogenhafen Barons. We'll be using the contents from this box that comes with everything you need to play this game throughout this video, and I'll leave a link here to a Blood Bowl playlist where you can find an unboxing of this, plus some simple paint schemes for getting the minis onto the gridiron. I'll point out here that this video is only going to cover the basics for playing, so not going over all the special traits, and we'll only look at how an exhibition match works, so no league rules here. You can find all the time codes in the description below, so you can jump to any section if you need to refresh your memory on a certain mechanic as well as a link to a PayPal wallet if you would like to help support the Jamhammer channel. Any donations will be gratefully received and put towards creating more content like this. Now, let's crack on with learning how to play Blood Bowl. This plays a little differently from other Games Workshop tabletop games in that it operates a bit like a board game rather than a war game. There's no terrain or table to set up, only a board to represent the playing field so it's really quick and easy to get going. You can see on the board here that it's a grid of squares. These represent how distance is measured in this game, so no need for tape measures either. The board is 15 squares wide and 26 squares long, which is pretty big at around 21 inches by 35. There are several sections painted on the pitch. Each short end of the pitch has an end zone for scoring spectacular touchdowns. Running the length of it are two wide zones, on either side of a central zone down the middle. These are split in half along the length of the board by the line of scrimmage, which will separate the two teams prior to kickoff. Included in the second season box set are these two cardboard pieces representing dugouts. These allow us to track our team's scores, the game turn, and any re-rolls our team has been allocated. There are also areas for players in reserve, players that have been knocked out on the pitch and are waiting to recover, and those players who are just a little bit too dead to carry on playing. We also have a healthy supply of dice. There's a 16 sided die, or d16, that isn't used much, mostly rolled if we need to select a player at random from our roster. A d8 used for picking a random direction on the pitch, a gold classic d6s with these neat Blood Bowl logos for the sixes, that are used in the typical manner for skills checks, rolling on damage tables, and so on. And then we have these special dice with five symbols that reveal what our players do when they make a block action. The opponent is pushed back one square, this symbol is on here twice. The opponent gets pushed back and knocked down. The opponent either gets pushed back or knocked down depending on a special skill. The active player bounces off and gets knocked down themselves or both players get knocked down by the melee. We'll see how these play out in the blitz and block actions later on. We then have these silvery templates. The first, this eight-pointed symbol of chaos, as a random direction template. To use this, we roll the d8 and pick a direction, such as here, a six, 
so this would mean something is moving left. Mostly the ball. Mostly. Then we have a throw-in template which operates in a similar manner but with a d6 instead. This tends to be used when the ball goes out of bounds and needs to be thrown back onto the pitch. So roll to 4 here, meaning it will be going straight ahead. Finally we have this long measuring stick that allows us to gauge how far a throw can travel. This little circle is placed over a player, say this imperial thrower here, and the ball symbols have 1 to 4 etches to show what negative modifiers a throw will have. Essentially, the further the throw, the more difficult it is to pull off. Finally, the most important feature, the ball itself. The aim of the game is to get a player from your team holding the ball into your opponent's end zone for a touchdown. So only one ball in play at a time, but we do get these neat pegged ones that fit into the mini's bases to indicate a player has possession of the ball. These are super tiny and I seem to have lost my painted one, so we'll just use this red one for now. The ball itself moves in three random ways across the pitch when it's not being carried by a player. Deviate, bounce and scatter. The first of these, deviate, occurs at kickoff and if a player really fumbles their throw. To perform this we use the random direction templates with a d8 and a d6. The d8 tells us the direction and the d6 tells us how far the ball travels. So six squares in that diagonal left direction like this. If the ball lands in an unoccupied square, or one that has a prone player in it, the ball will then bounce. Bounce, as the name implies, is when the ball bounces, and there's just one roll of the d8 against that template, and the ball moves one square in that direction. Finally, scatter, when the ball travels in an unexpected manner, is similar to the others, but instead we roll the d8 three times and move the ball one square in each of those directions, like this. 8, so down, 7, so diagonal, and that's another 8, so down again. If this third roll means the ball lands in a square with a player, then they have to try to catch it. However, like deviating, if it doesn't land in a square occupied by a standing player, then the ball will bounce, so that's a fourth and final roll of the d8. It's also worth pointing out here that if a player enters a square occupied by the ball, then they have to attempt to pick it up. If the ball leaves the table, then it's thrown back in by the crowd. The throw-in template is placed with the Blood Bowl logo over the last square that the ball occupied before leaving the pitch. Then a d6 is rolled for the direction, followed by 2d6 for the distance it travels. So in this example, a 3 means it's going straight across the pitch, for a distance of 7 squares. As per usual, it will bounce in an unoccupied square, and a standing player will have to try and catch it if it lands in their square. We'll see all of these dice, templates and the ball in action as we go through player activations later on. Before that, let's cover some general rules. Blood Bowl takes place over two halves, with each coach having 8 turns to activate their players for a total of 32 turns per game. All of the coach's players may be activated in a turn, so it's more like 40k than Kill Team here. This may sound like a lot of turns, however there are a lot of ways that a coach can lose their turn called a turnover. Let's cover these now. If a player from the active team falls over, bam, they lose their turn. This applies if they are knocked down to, like our human here, trying to tackle and instead being clobbered by the orc. It really is that easy to lose a turn. A turnover is also caused if a player drops the ball, either by falling over, being tackled, fumbling a catch, being forced from the pitch, or simply by having butterfingers and failing to pick it up from the ground. Even if the ball bounces and is caught by another of your players, it's still a turnover. If the ball is deflected or intercepted when you try to pass it, that's turnover. If a player with the ball is thrown, yes the player, that's blood ball, and fails to land safely or lands out of bounds, that's a turnover. If a player is sent off for a foul, oh you better believe that's a turnover. And a turnover is caused if one of your players scores a touchdown. 
that may sound like a lot to remember, but basically, if it's your turn, and your player, or the ball, hit the ground, it's over to your opponent. Speaking of players, there's a few more general rules we should cover with them. Each of your players has a one square wide zone around them called their tackle zone. So, this orc moves up, but it's still one square from the human, and it's not in his tackle zone. The human player goes next, and moves next to the orc, stepping into that zone, and both players are now set to be marking each other. Nothing happens yet, but if the human now moves out of that zone, they have to perform a dodge roll using their agility stat, as the orc automatically tries to tackle them. We'll see how dodging plays out in the movement section later. If the orc is down on the ground, either prone or stunned, then they lose their tackle zone and the human can move around them freely. Players are often tackled or fall over during a game of Blood Bowl. Typically, they'll be laid prone by these and placed face up on the board to represent this. The player now can't do anything. Their only option is to get back to standing. They can stand up again once they have been activated on their team's turn. This will cost the player 3 squares of their movement allowance, and counts as a move for the purpose of other actions. If the player is stunned, usually due to a pretty nasty fall, this means they have to remain down and miss a turn. To indicate being stunned, they will be placed face down instead. Only at the beginning of their team's next turn can the player be rolled over to prone, and then stand up on their activation. If a player is forced off the table for any reason, then an injury roll is immediately made against them by the opposing player, with 2d6 on the injuries table, as we'll see later. Now I mentioned agility and movement allowance there, which brings us on to our players' profiles. Each of our teams are picked from a roster much like other tabletop games. In Blood Bowl, our players have a simple profile with just 5 stats. MA, ST, AG, PA, and AV. Using the Imperial Retainer Lineman as an example, their MA, or Movement Allowance, is 6, allowing them to move up to 6 squares on the board in a turn. Their ST, Strength, is 3, which will be used when they are involved in a block action. Their Agility is 4+, meaning they need to roll a 4 or above on any checks that require an Agility test, such as dodging out of the way of a tackle like we mentioned earlier. Their PA or passing ability is 4+, plus, so 4s and above on a d6 to test to see how well they can throw the ball. It's worth noting here that rolling a natural 1 on agility or passing tests is always a fail, and rolling a 6 is always a success. Finally, AV is the player's armour value, and this is the number your opponent needs to match or beat on two d6s in order to injure your player. You may have noticed a cost there for our Imperial Lineman of 45,000 gold. In an exhibition match, you and your opponent will agree on a budget to spend on your teams. The rulebook suggests a sum of 1,150,000 gold per team as the ideal amount for this. Turning to the Human Nobility roster again, you can see under QTY, Quantity, how many of each player you can hire. So, lots of linemen, but the option to only bring two Noble Blitzers. You can find team rosters like these in the rulebook, as well as in Spike magazine. You can spend your budget on no more than 16 players, as per the cost on their roster, plus all sorts of extra bonuses like rerolls to use in the game ahead, apothecaries, cheerleaders, and yes, even barrels of beer. We won't cover all of these now, or how treasuries work for league play, but the only key thing to remember is that you must hire at least 11 players to have a full Blood Bowl team. A few pre-game rolls now, and then we're ready to set up. Blood Bowl, as thorough and immersive as it is, requires us to make a roll for Fan Factor. Each coach rolls a d3, by rolling a six-sided die and halving the result. This number reflects how many thousands of fans have turned up to cheer for our teams, but rarely makes a difference for simple exhibition matches. So we have 3,000 cheering for the humans, and just 1,000 
for the Orcs. Next, we roll on the weather table. Each coach rolls a d6, so 2d6 total, and we add the results together to tell us if there will be any modifiers for our players. So, some very unlucky rolling here, with a result of 2, meaning the heat is so sweltering that each coach will be temporarily losing d3 players per turn. There are a few other steps and rolls to make for a league match, but for us, we're ready to flip a coin to determine the kicking team. Now, let's get some players on the pitch. The kicking team sets up first, and they have to set up exactly 11 players. And in subsequent drives, it's likely that a few players will be... indisposed. So, we may have to set up fewer than 11 players, but if 11 are available, and conscious, they have to be fielded. Three players have to be set up on the line of scrimmage, i.e. the line running down the centre of the pitch that separates the two teams. So, three orcs there, with the rest of the team dotted around in their half. You can set these up however you choose, but the only other constraint to bear in mind is that you can only set up two players in each wide zone, the marked off areas on either side of the centre. We can see here that the greenskins have two goblins in one wide zone, and an orc and goblin in the opposite zone. Now the other coach will set up the receiving team in the same manner with three on the line of scrimmage and no more than two in each wide zone. The kicking team will now kick off, but it's the receiving team who will take the first turn. It's not always essential to pick a kicking player, but some special rules will require it, so it's a good habit to get into. Anywho, the kicking team's coach then decides on a square in the opponent's half of the pitch for the ball to land. The ball will then deviate from its intended target. So, let's say the humans are kicking off. They pick their thrower in the back, and place the kick just behind the line of scrimmage near to that goblin. They get out the random direction template and roll for deviation, a d8 for direction, and a d6 for range. It's a 1 and a 3 respectively, so the ball will deviate 3 squares along the board. However, another roll interrupts us before the ball lands. Each coach now has to roll another d6 each, and add their scores again for a result on the kickoff event table. Our coaches here roll a 1 and a 5, so a total of 6, meaning they get the cheering fans result, and we'll resolve that now. Then the ball returns to Earth. It deviates up behind the troll and lands in an unoccupied square, so we'll now bounce. Rolling a d8 against the template and the result is a 6, so it bounces and comes to rest on the ground. If the ball lands over the line of scrimmage in the kicking player's half, this causes a touchback and the ball will instead be handed to a player of the receiving coach's team. In our example here, this would be the greenskins. Now it's time for the receiving player's first turn. The bulk of Blood Bowl is spent on activating your team's players. On your turn, you can activate all 11 of your players, but you don't have to, and as mentioned before, there are a lot of opportunities for you to lose your turn. It's worth noting that you have to declare the action your player will take before they do it. So you'll have to say if your Imperial lineman is going to attempt to pass the ball prior to attempting it. You can change your mind, but the opportunity to pass will now be lost for the rest of that turn. There are seven basic actions that each of your players can perform. Move, blitz, block, foul, pass, handoff, and throw teammate. However, besides move and block, you can only perform the other actions once per turn. We'll cover these in more detail now with the game underway. The Greenskins player received the kick and it's their turn. They decide to activate their goblin near the ball and move towards it. They have a movement allowance of 6 and take 3 of these, stepping into the same square as the ball. The goblin has to try to pick up the ball now. To do this, they have to make an agility test to see if they manage to pick it up. They have an agility stat of 3 plus, so need a 3 or above to successfully pick up the ball. It's a 6, so that's an automatic success, and they now have possession of the ball. They still have movement left, so are free to take a few more steps. Huh, somehow a teammate is already stunned and blocking their way. 
the goblin could go around, but this will waste a lot of their movement allowance, so instead, they decide to jump. To do this, they move as normal, but cannot share the same square with another player, so two of their movement is spent to get them over the stun player. Then, to make sure they deftly stepped over the down player, another agility test is needed. It's a three, which is just enough to make it, and they're cleared to proceed. In Blood Bowl, you tend to test for a thing after it's already happened. Like this, the goblins spent all of their movement allowance. However, they also have the option to attempt to rush. This allows any player to move an extra two squares, but they have to roll a d6 for each square to ensure no mishaps take place. On a roll of two and above, they're fine. On a roll of one, they fall over. So the goblin rushes, their coach rolls a d6, it's a three, so they're fine. But wait, you see that? They entered the tackle zone of that imperial lineman, then they left it. This means that the human player attempts to tackle the goblin as they move by. The goblin has to make another dodge roll to save themselves, needing a three plus again as per their agility stats, and it's a two. The goblin gets to complete the move, but is caught by the human player and falls over. Now, four things happen. The goblin falls over to become prone in their square. An armor roll is made against the goblin by the human player's coach, as we'll see in the block action next. And the ball is dropped. It bounces from the goblin square, so out comes the template and the d8. It's a five, so it bounces diagonally towards the human. And because an active player fell down, plus the ball was dropped, that's two reasons for a turnover to be triggered, and the Greenskins coach loses the rest of their turn. Brutal stuff. The human coach takes their first turn now, and activates their Noble Blitzer on the other side of the pitch. They declare that the human player will be, quite appropriately, performing a Blitz action. Once per turn, a coach can activate one of their players to do this, and it means the player can move and block in any order, i.e. they could move, block and then move, or block and then move, etc. Also note that performing a blitz action will cost one of your movement allowance. So, let's see how the block works. This blitzer has moved into the tackle zone of the goblin and is now performing a block action. First, we need to check the S, strength, of each of the players to see how many block dice the active player gets. So, the human has a strength of 3, but the goblin only has 2. Since the human has a strength advantage, their coach gets to roll 2 block dice and pick the result. If the strength was the same, they would only roll 1. If the strength was double, they would get to roll 3 dice and pick the result. The coach rolls a pushback and a pow. So, they pick the pow meaning the goblin is pushed back away from the human by one square, then gets knocked down. The human player can make a follow-up move now if they like, which means they can advance into the square their opponent just vacated, even if they blitzed. The goblin's down. Now the human coach gets to roll to see if they've broken their armour. To do this, an armour roll is needed, so the goblin has an AV, armour value, of 8+, plus, meaning that the human coach needs to roll an 8 or above on 2d6 to break the goblin's armour. And it's a 9. Definitely broken. Next another roll to see how injured the goblin is. The coach rolls 2d6 again and compares the result with the injury table. It's a 7 so the goblin is stunned. The greenskins coach turns their player over to indicate this and the goblin will be missing the next turn. If the result was a 10 or higher there, then this would cause another 2d6 roll on the casualty table. Most of these have a lasting effect on a player for league rules, and can be pretty much ignored here for our exhibition match. Suffice it to say, that if they're a casualty, then the player is too injured or dead to carry on playing and is out of the game. The strength advantage works both ways though. Let's look at this now. It's still the human coach's turn, and they activate this lineman next. The coach announces their player will block the orc in the adjacent square. As many players as you like can block, but the general rule is that a player cannot move and block. 
This includes standing back up from prone. The blitz action is an exception to this, as is the follow-up move and some special skills. But this lineman didn't move and he's blocking. We check the strength again and yep, three for the human, but oh dear, this beast of an orc has an S of four. This means that two block dice will be rolled again, but it's the opposing coach, here the greenskins, who gets to pick the result. If the strength was double, it would be three dice again here too. So, the human coach rolls and gets a pushback or a stumble. Stumble would mean the orc getting knocked down. The greenskins coach instead picks the safer option, which just pushes their orc back by one square. The human lineman now opts to make his follow-up move into that space. To even the score, there are also offensive and defensive assists. Basically, this means that you get plus one to strength if one of your players is within the target's tackle zone, but only that one. So the assisting player can't be marking another opponent. This time then, the lineman has back up from that bouncer, giving him plus one strength before matching the orc, and meaning only one block dice is rolled. Whoops! It's a player down result, and the greenskins coach gets to make an armor roll against the felled lineman and this would cause a turnover for the human coach. Just goes to show there's never a sure thing in Blood Bowl. Let's return to that poor downed goblin. The human player isn't even interested in the ball. No, she spotted an opportunity to inflict some pain on the downed goblin and declares a foul. Unlike blocking, the player is allowed to move before, but not after, this action. She steps into an adjacent square and sticks the boot in kicking the goblin and immediately getting the opportunity to roll against their armour. Offensive and defensive assists apply here too and grant a plus one or minus one modifier to the armour roll respectively. 2d6 rolled and it's an eight which is just enough to break the goblin's armour. This now leads to an injury roll and it's a double six, more than enough to remove this goblin from the match. But even in a game as brutal as Blood Bowl, there are rules, and fouling, though encouraged, is still officially an illegal move. If a coach rolls a double for the armor roll or a subsequent injury roll like this, then the ref has spotted their player in the act and sends them off. The coach then then contests the result. If you decide to do this, roll a d6. On a 6, you've convinced the ref that it was all in good sport and your player gets to stay. A 2 to 5, and it doesn't matter what you say, the player is sent off. Roll a 1 however, and the ref ejects the player, as well as you the coach. You lose the ability to argue with the ref anymore this game. Regardless of the result, if one of your players gets caught fouling, a turnover is caused, and our human coach here has lost their turn. So that's the more violent portion out of the way. How about a test of skill? Once per turn, a coach can elect for one of their players to attempt to pass the ball. It's the human coach's turn, and their imperial thrower has the ball and wants to pass it to the blitzer further down the field. The coach declares what their player intends to do, then measures the trajectory and distance with the range template. Each of the ball symbols after the first one reflects an additional minus one modifier for the throwing player's roll to pass the ball, rounding up. Their target then is just beyond the two-etched ball symbol there, so this is going to class as a long pass and net them a negative two to their passing ability. The coach now rolls for the accuracy of the throw using the player's PA. The thrower here has a PA passing ability of three plus, so with that minus two modifier for range, needs a five or a six for an accurate throw. And it's a six, an automatic success. The ball sails expertly through the air. Oh no, a rival player is in the way. If an opposing player is underneath the trajectory of a pass, then their coach gets to attempt a deflection or possibly interception. They roll an agility test here, so three plus. However, as they are trying to deflect such an accurate pass, they are at a minus three modifier. Like much of Blood Bowl, the success of an action is predicated on what came before it. So a six will be needed here. 
It's a two though, so that ball sails straight overhead and towards the blitzer. Now the human coach needs to see if this player catches the ball. This means, you guessed it, another agility test with negative modifiers applied depending on the quality of the throw. This one is accurate, so no negative modifiers means a 4 and above. And they just about managed to grab it from the air and are now in possession of the ball. It's worth noting that if any one of these players, the thrower, the goblin or the blitzer, was being marked, then each of these actions would be at an additional minus one modifier per player marking them. So it's still the human coach's activation here, and they want to run the ball into the end zone for a touchdown. There's an orc blocking the way though. The blitzer could try to move through the orc's tackle zone, making dodge after dodge as they try to get by, or he could hand off the ball to another player, this imperial lineman nearby. The active player is allowed to move prior to the handoff and, unlike passing, doesn't need to test how well they hand over the ball. All that's needed is an agility test for the receiving player to see if they manage to take the ball successfully. So, like most tests in Blood Bowl, the action is completed. The ball is moved to the lineman's square, then a 4 plus is needed to complete the handoff, and oh no, failure, the ball is dropped, it bounces, and it causes a turnover. Over on the far side of the pitch, and this goblin is way too far away from that fumble ball. They're surrounded on all sides by human players. If only they could fly. Enter the troll. This player is activated by the green skin coach and declares that they will be throwing their teammate. Note that a coach can only perform a pass action or a throw teammate action per turn with their players, but not both. As usual though, the troll gets to move before, but not after, the throw. And it picks up the goblin from an adjacent square. Although we're disregarding special abilities here, it's worth pointing out that only players with the throw teammate skill can throw players with the right stuff trait, like our troll and goblin combo here. Much like throwing a ball then, the coach must first measure for range. Unlike the ball though, a player is much heavier and can only go as far as the second symbol on the ruler, so only a short throw is possible. Then a d6 is rolled for the quality. Throwing to this range means a minus one modifier and the troll's passing ability was only five plus to begin with, so nothing but a six will do. Man, I wish I could roll this well in an actual game. It's a six. The goblin whizzes through the air and lands at their target destination. If only it were that simple. First, the goblin is going to scatter, so, three rolls of the d8 to see where they end up. Little bit off course, but not too bad. Now the goblin needs to test for their landing. Like other Blood Bowl tests, as the preceding event went well, that will make this easier, so no negative modifiers here, as it was a superb throw. And with a roll of four, they land deftly on their feet and are free to be activated themselves now. Once again, there are minus one modifiers for the throwing player if they are marked and for the landing player if they land in an opposition player's tackle zone. If a player lands outside the pitch, then they are immediately set upon by the crowd and a roll is done on the injuries table. In the event of a stun result from this roll, they are placed in the reserves box. But what else can go wrong? Well, if a natural one is rolled, it means the gobbo doesn't much like being picked up and squirms loose. The goblin falls, bounces like they were the ball, and then has to roll an agility test lest they fall over. If it's an unnatural one, like if a result of one after all the modifiers have been applied, such as if the troll had rolled a two here, then the throw is terrible and the goblin would deviate from the troll square stead like this. So going five squares in that direction. Ooh, and they actually land on an occupied square. 
this ain't gonna be pretty. So, now this other goblin suddenly gets hit by a flying teammate and is knocked down. As usual, this results in the opposing coach getting to roll against their armour. Luckily, they didn't get an 8 this time. Now our flying gobbo bounces from the square they landed in. It's a 5, so they go diagonally and land on the other side of the human lineman. And then it's knocked down too, meaning another armour roll. And an injury. And they're stunned. I bet that lineman doesn't have a clue what just happened. That's just about everything a coach can do with their players during a turn. If a turn doesn't end in a turnover or running out of players, then it ends by scoring a touchdown. You can score either by running the ball into the opponent's end zone with one of your players, or having one of your players in the opponent's end zone successfully catch a pass. Once a touchdown is scored, that team wins a point and play stops to set up the next drive. A drive ends then with a touchdown or when both coaches have had their 8 turns. This stoppage is an opportunity to recover any players that have been knocked out and are currently in your dugout. Roll a d6 for each of them. On a 4+, plus, they are recovered and can be set up for the next drive. 1-3 to three though, and they're still out cold. If there are still turns remaining, or another half of the game to play, the coaches will set up their teams again. If the previous drive ended with a touchdown, then the team that scored is on defence now, so we'll set up first and kick off to the team that conceded the touchdown. At the end of the second half, after all 32 turns have been played, whoever scored the most touchdowns wins. The exhibition match will end now with a win, loss or draw, but league play can go on into extra time. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope that you enjoyed it, if you did, please consider liking it, subscribing to the channel and clicking the bell to be notified of new videos being released. And that's how you play Blood Bowl. There's a lot to take in here, but once you get into the flow of how the game works, it really does move along at a quick pace. Someone's turn could last until they activate all 11 of their players, or their first activation could see their player trip over their own shoes and knock themselves out. This can lead to some really fun gameplay, where you end up in genuinely tense and spectacular situations, such as a player defying the odds and beautifully spiralling a long pass to their teammate waiting in the end zone. We've only covered the general mechanics for an exhibition match, but there's even deeper rules with this game for all manner of player advancement, skills development, special abilities, prayers to nuffle, league play, chainsaws, grenades, secret weapons, and so on. There'll be more Blood Bowl videos being released in the near future, so please do keep an eye out for new content coming soon to Jamhammer. In the meantime, there are plenty of other videos available on the channel, including a few that are on screen now for you to click on. Thanks again for watching.